League of Goddamn Legends. I feel like we've all at least seen it by now. It's that multiplayer strategy tile that's slowly become one of the most popular games on the planet. Over the last decade and change, it's won a ton of awards, amassed a player base of over 115 million active summoners, revolutionized esports, and got an anime that was hands down the best thing to hit Netflix in 2021. And that's just a fraction of their resume. So today, we're hopping into the League Icebergs to talk about how this game, that surprisingly started off pretty bad, became the world phenomenon that it is now. On this episode of Honest Gaming History, we discuss the history and lore of League of Legends. Play that intro, son! But before we get into this League lecture, shout out to the person that this video is actually dedicated to, my girlfriend. League of Legends is her favorite game ever and her birthday was on the 5th, so I thought, why not cover the story of her favorite game on her birthday? Or after her birthday, because this video took mad long to make, my god. But still, happy belated birthday, babe. You not only make me a better content creator, but a better person as well, and I appreciate you so much for that. I hope you hit all your goals this year and I can't wait to celebrate more birthdays with you. Not going to drop her government out there, but if you want to support her, check her out on Twitch. She goes by Miss Yorichi, like the Bleach character. But with that, on to the history of League of Legends. So, I guess your boy Conscious isn't invited to the interest anymore, huh? Bro, you know it's not like that. I was just- Nah, nah, it's cool. You want to wish your girl a happy birthday. I get it. It's just crazy because nobody asked Conscious if he wants to say something. Conscience. But why am I surprised? You just want me here for the content. Nobody cares about Conscience's feelings. Nigga. You come at me daily, and now you want to talk about feelings? And there you go making it about yourself again. Is this the kind of person y'all want to watch, people? This selfish ass nigga? Is this your king? Uh, are you done? Are you done wasting runtime? Wow, so I'm wasting runtime now. That's crazy. Here I thought- Bruh, the video. Can we focus on that, please? Hi, damn. I was just joking. I used to cry about it. I was taking shit so seriously. I'm always, mm, nope. Nope, it's a new year and I'm dealing with my own conscience pushing to the brink of insanity. The worst part is that I'm not even real. Anyway, like I said, onto the history of League of Legends. So to talk about League, we must begin with the game that started all of this, Warcraft 3. Released in 2002 by Blizzard Entertainment, this is a real-time strategy game that took place in the vast Warcraft universe. I never played it, but the game did exceptionally well. Fans specifically loved the 3D world they got to explore along with the character models that lived in it. The love for the game only grew stronger, until in 2003 when someone decided to add their own changes to the mix. A developer by the name of Kyle Yul Somer used a world editor that came with the game to mod the map. He created a 5v5 multiplayer game where players would control heroes and coordinates to take down their enemy's base. The mod was dubbed Defense of the Ancients, or Dota, and though Yul didn't see it yet, he started something huge here. Dota was pretty much the first MOBA ever created, MOBA standing for Multiplayer Online Battle Arena. Its release brought about tons of avid fans, as well as spin-offs, the main spin-off title being Dota All-Stars. This upgrade to Dota was made possible by developers Mayan and Ragnar. They took all the popular characters and threw them into this one, hence the name All-Stars. Thanks to this new Dota, the MOBA genre gained even more clout. The game even became the center of multiple esports tournaments, with its first tournament occurring in 2005's BlizzCon. By 2008, everybody was talking about Dota. What was at first just a mod was now a force in the industry. But there was one big problem. Since this was all a mod, the game required a shit ton of outside tools to run. There was also no tutorial, and matchmaking had to be done manually, all things that would definitely scare away new players. Enter the protagonists of the story, Mark Trindamere Merrill and Brandon Rise Beck. These guys were best bros in college where they majored in business. They also happened to be big fans of video games. After they graduated and got their feet wet in the workforce, they decided they wanted to act on their love for gaming by creating their own. They saw the problems with Dota and wanted to create a more optimized version that would work as its own standalone game. But these guys were business majors. They could manage the business side of things, sure, but they didn't have anyone to actually code the game. To find recruits, they hosted a Dota tournament in their alma mater, the University of Southern California. Through this, they found their first interns, then in 2006 they founded Riot Games. They started developing their own game which was at first titled Onslaught. After months of work, the game was ready to be shown in 2007's Game Developers Conference, but people didn't fuck with it at all. From Jump, Mark and Brandon wanted their game to be free to play. Dota showed them that gaming as a service not only worked, but it gives game devs a chance to continue to improve and expand upon the game, as well as grow its community. Instead of having players spend money on the game itself, they would incorporate skins for their characters that cost real money. 
Publishers at the GDC didn't see their vision though, since in the West, free to play was a pretty new concept. People were like, hold up, this is gonna be free? And there's no single player? Yeah, y'all could miss me with that bullshit. Obviously this left Riot shook. Nobody was willing to publish their game and on top of that, the game wasn't even that good. According to Jeff Ju, Riot's second intern, he and his colleagues were pretty much forced to play the game even though they didn't want to. Imagine how tense it must have been in that office, son. Ah, uh, you see, this, this is what I like to see. People avidly working on, hey, 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 you, what the fuck are you doing? Doing my taxes. Taxes? Bruh, you gotta be. Taxes? Nigga, can you read? Yes. Then read the wall. Read the wall and tell me what the fuck that says. Onslaught is life. Onslaught is fucking life. You wanna lose your job, bro? No. Then get the fuck off of TurboTax and play some goddamn Onslaught. Yeah, shit must have been stressful. And to add on to the stress, there was another more polished looking MOBA called Heroes of New Earth that was being made, and it looked better than Onslaught. This along with many other problems left Riot thinking about whether this free to play idea was going to work. Regardless, they stuck to their guns, changed the Onslaught to League of Legends, and released a finished game in 2009. Fun fact, its full name was League of Legends Clash of Fates. They were going to change the subtext with each new update like how World of Warcraft does, but they decided to just stick with League of Legends. Like Dota, the game involves five players working together to destroy the enemy team's base. Each player controls a champion and must choose a specific role upon entering a game. First, there's the top laner, the one responsible for defending, well, the top lane. Second is the mid laner, don't think I have to explain what they do. Next are the Attack Damage Carry, or ADC, and Support Rolls. These guys run the bot lane, with the ADC being the main source of damage for the team. Then last, there is my role, the Jungler. These guys traverse around the jungle and pretty much function as map support for their team. You need to jump somebody in lane real quick? Call in your friendly neighborhood jungler and we got you, if we're in the area. The game released with a whopping 40 champion roster, but sadly the problems for Riot didn't stop. Upon release, there were a bunch of technical problems, and while the free-to-play model worked in bringing players in, it was hard to keep them with all these issues bogging down the game. Along with all that, there was also the growing toxicity of the community. As I'm sure some of you guys know, League is known for having one of the most toxic player bases. Like there was a whole study done by an IBM AI showing how assholery is abundant in the community. Back then people blamed it on the old Dota fans who apparently were also pretty toxic. But even with all these problems stopping them, Riot continued to work on their baby. Patches were released on a constant basis to fix game issues and bounce out the champion pool. And what's commendable is how transparent they were about all this. Every time a patch was released, the dev team would let the community know exactly what was changed through patch notes. This is a practice they still follow today. And to try to put a handle on all the bitch ass behavior, they show some incorporate a system that rewards players for, you know, not being a dick and actually helping your team. Over the years, community feel changes continue to be added to both improve the game and keep it fresh. Thanks to these changes, the community grew to an exponential rate. Now League of Legends is a freaking behemoth in the video game industry. In 2020 alone, this game made over $1.75 billion. And their success doesn't stop there. They've quite frankly become the center of esports. Since 2011, League has hosted multiple tournaments with their annual world championship being the hypest, and these events have only gotten bigger and better. Yo, facts. What started as a small tournament in Sweden is now a worldwide event that's streamed on the internet and television. For many, these competitions were the first time they saw a game garner this much hype. Like, these tournaments are inspirational, fam. I don't even know why. I wouldn't call myself an esports fan, but bro, the excitement is contagious. Y'all have no idea how shook I was when I saw people playing League on ESPN, the freaking sports network. Like, what the fuck? Bruh, by 2016, more people were watching these League tournaments than some major sports events. Colleges and high schools have been forming esports teams to compete in tournaments, fam. There are students out there who finish class, go play video games competitively, and can put that as an extracurricular on their resume. Hell, Japan is opening its first esports high school this spring. A high school for playing video games. Where the fuck was this when I was young? Bro, esports players are seen as athletes now, like actual athletes. Do you understand how crazy but fucking lit that is? The Olympics, the goddamn Olympics, held a virtual event for esports last year. Esports, son! Nigga, stop yelling. Sorry, sorry, I just, you know how a bunch of other people back in the day were like, man, gaming is evil, it's a waste of time. It fills me with so much joy to know that they were all wrong, fam. Gaming is lit, it's always been lit, y'all just had to open your eyes. I cool, but stop yelling, you're mad loud. Gonna be real with you, 
can't make that promise. But yeah, League of Legends has been a force in esports. Not saying they're the only ones responsible for esports getting so popular, but they're definitely the protects of the anime that is esports. You could seriously make a whole video talking about League's competitive history, but honestly, I check out the score esports for that. They make dope videos based on esports, and their League of Legends history video helped me out a lot with this, so show them some love. Anyway, League of Legends is currently in its 12th season, and speaking as someone who's been playing it since like 2012, I gotta say this game is fun as fuck. Starting off, I didn't really see the hype, but as I played it more, I don't know, I just kind of grew attached. All the added changes also make it feel like a way different game from when I first picked it up, and I'm here for more changes. Don't get it twisted though, he's still trash. My nigga has been living in bronze. Hey, nobody asked for that. But yeah, League is lit. I say give it a try. Yes, the player base can be pretty toxic, but you can just do what I do, mute everyone. Can't fuck with me if I can't hear you. But with that, it's time to switch gears and do what we do best here in Honest Gaming History. Let's talk about the lore behind the vast universe of League. Alright, so League's lore is kind of a clusterfuck. Originally, you had to rely on character descriptions and the like to get a semblance of what was going on here. Luckily, now League has a whole website dedicated to lore, and an encyclopedia entitled Realms of Runeterra that gives more information about the world. But, and this was news to me, there is also skin lore. Wait, wait, skin lore? Oh yeah, the character skins have lore too, and there is a lot of it. Thanks to these skins, there's a ton of alternate universes within the canon. But we're not gonna get into all that for two reasons. One, unless you're already a fan of the skin line, knowing the lore of their universe won't mean much to the main canon. And the second reason, there is no way in hell I'm gonna read up on the skins of all 140 champions in League. I love me some lore, but not that much. So to keep things simple, we'll be sticking with the main timeline. The creation of the Empire of Noxus serves as year zero for this timeline. So I'll be using before Noxus and after Noxus to describe when important events happen. With all that being said, let's begin. In the beginning, there was nothing, just deep, meaningless darkness. Then from out of nowhere, the universe was born. Along with the universe came the void, the manifestation of all the nothingness beyond the universe. This, um, realm, I think, is run by beings known as the Watchers. At this point in the timeline, they didn't really understand what life was and weren't aware of their own sentience, but they'll become really important soon. Back to the good part of the universe, the first Lessio beings appeared, one of them being Aurelian Sol. Sol and his brethren traveled the cosmos discovering more and more about the universe. Eventually, he started creating the stars for fun. Imagine just having that power, creating astronomical balls of light for fun. But Sol wanted to flex his creativity some more, so he started connecting the stars, thus forming constellations. These constellations soon gain life and become new celestial beings dubbed Aspects. Then 9,000 years before Noxus, the catalyst for the plot appears, a planet named Runeterra. Literally meaning magic earth, Runeterra is composed of both a spirit and a physical realm. Nobody really knows who brought it here, but we do know that these things called world runes are responsible for creating it. This new planet intrigued the Celestials, but the Watchers were sick of all this life running around. Here they were chilling in nothingness for eons. Now this big ball of light is shining in their face. From this point forward, they make it their mission to destroy the rest of the universe. A little bit aggressive, but I get it. Meanwhile, on Runeterra, life is flourishing. Powerful beings and the spirit gods came to be. Among them came the demigods who created what will soon be Freljord. The Freljordian demigods we know by name are Orn, the god of forging and craftsmanship, Valhir or the Volibear, the god of the storms, and Anivia, a benevolent god who protects Freljord. There is also the Iron Boar, the Seal Sister, the Two-Headed Raven, and the Clever Lynx, but we have little to no info on them. Maybe they'll become champions in the future, who knows? Or maybe they're already in the game and we don't know. Anyway, following the creation of Freljord came the birth of mortals. Yordles, magical creatures from the spirit realm who dead look like Pokemon, also came to be and started living together with the other mortal races in the physical realm. One of the first civilizations created by the mortals was in a place named Ionia, also known as the First Lands. This is also the place where the first major war in this timeline occurs, the Titan War. Sometime after the discovery of Ionia, an epic battle ensued between the mortals of Ionia and Sky Giants. The Ionians couldn't handle the giants on their own, so the more spiritual of them tapped into the power of the spirit realm for help, thus turning them into Vestaya Shire. Thanks to them, the mortals won the Titan War. After this, the Vestaya Shire decided to chill with the mortals. Not much is known about what happened to them afterwards, but their descendants are known as the Vestaya. Around this time, humans started settling in Freljord. A bunch of them praised Orn and followed his lead by picking up crafting and forging, but old Valhir didn't like that. My man was like, Yo, who the fuck put all these humans here? Then call up on two of his demigod brethren to wage war on the humans. To fight against these gods, three sisters by the name of Lysandra, Avarosa, and Serelda banded together with their army known as the Frost Guard. Valhir saw the upcoming smoke, so he went to his brother Orin like, 
Bro, I'm gonna need some weapons for this war. These humans looking kind of fierce. But Orstrait tells him, nah. This leads to a six-day war between the two brothers that destroys both Orn's home and the home of his followers. Meanwhile, Lissandra decides to make a deal with the freaking Watchers to win this war. May I remind you that the Watchers are the dudes in charge of the realm that want to slap the life out the universe. Thanks to this deal, the three sisters gain immortality, but Lissandra had a feeling that the Watchers would try to play her. So with Orn's help, they create a structure to seal them. Afterwards, they defeat the demigods and unite all of Freljord. Sadly, the peace that comes from this unity doesn't last for long. 8,000 years before Noxus, Lysandra and her sisters have a falling out, thus sparking the War of the Three Sisters. The nation is thrown into chaos because of the war, and to make matters worse, the Watchers appear to take what's theirs. To stop everything, Lysandra sacrifices her sisters and everyone else involved in the war to seal the Watchers in true ice. From this day onward, she does everything she can to wipe her sisters and the Watchers away from history. She secretly leaves the Frost Guard in the Howling Abyss to make sure the Watchers will try to escape from their temporary prison. The next important event in League history doesn't happen until 2,000 years before Noxus. Humans from a distant unknown land in the east migrate to the west to spread their vast knowledge. This is known as the Westward Migration. Throughout this 1,000 year time period, they established several new nations across Runeterra. Shirima, Ikathia, and Ixhaw were among these nations. However, what's arguably their most important discovery was the founding of Mount Targon. This is where the Celestials come back into the picture, which takes us to the next major time period in this timeline, the Golden Age of Shirima. This was a 2500 year time period that started 5000 years before Noxus. As the name implies, the Shirima Empire was copping straight W's during this time. But sadly, they were assholes. When Shirima was still new, Aurelian Sol appeared in front of Shirimas at Mount Targon. They praised him, but before long, the aspect showed their true malicious intentions. They snatch up a boy soul and lock him up. Then they instruct the Shirima symbol of Sundus to channel his energy. Pissed, Aurelian Sol vows to return to Runeterra to destroy the planet for imprisoning him. So now, not only is the Void after the planet, but a big ass cosmic dragon is too. Back on Runeterra, the Shirimans use the Sun Disc for a special ritual known as Ascension. This is a ceremony where through the Sun Discs, Aspects are able to imbue mortals with their power, thus creating God Warriors. Some chants from the roster who have ascended are Renekton and my boy Nasus. With these God Warriors, the Shiriman Empire is born. They begin taking over the other nations of the area, including Akathia. Their reign continues up until 2500 years before Noxus. After being enslaved by the Shirimans for centuries, Ikathia finally makes a move towards freedom. But the move they make is pretty fucking dumb. They pull Lysandra and try to use the power of the Void. These poor stupid ass niggas. Like with Lysandra, the plan completely backfires when the mages of Ikathia accidentally open a Void Rift. Voidborn pop out the rift leading to a massive war dubbed the Void War. Ascended warriors attempt to fight the Void, but many of them die. Zillion, a mage from Ikathia, takes as many people as he can and just leaves the timeline. Mages from Ixtal hide their people by creating a forest around them. Meanwhile, she didn't look in too hot for Shirima. The newest emperor of the nation, Azir, gets betrayed by his closest advisor, Zerath, right in the middle of his ascension. All because Azir wants to free the slaves of Shirima. Zerath, the fuck is your problem? This leads to the collapse of Shirima. The capital is blasted into the sand and Zerath gets locked in the Tomb of Emperors. That Void problem is still a problem though. Voidborn continue ravaging the region until around 2000 BN, when an ascendant warrior named Tarak uses a weapon called the Netherblade to take out a bunch of the Voidborn from their source. This is the same Netherblade that the champ Kassadin uses, by the way. Afterwards, two mages seal the rift in Akathia, but the damage done to the region thanks to the Void War leaves it in pretty bad shape. This leads to the next important event in the timeline, the Great Darken War. Remember all the Ascended Warriors who fought in the Void War? Well, a few of them who survived became twisted and tyrannical thanks to the Void. They started enslaving mortals within the region and called themselves Darken. Some Darken champs who were around during this time were Aatrox, Rost, and Varus. The Ascended who didn't lose their shit dubbed themselves Sunborn. Aware of the Darken threat, they team up to defeat them by sealing them in weapons. The war goes on until 550 BN, when the last Darken, Varus, gets locked away in his bow. This ends the Darken War, that's taking us to the beginning of another empire. Way over in the northern part of Runeterra lived a conqueror named Sanu Zal. Not much is known about his conquest, but what we do know is that he was a savage. Fortunately, he died though. Trapped in the afterlife, he realizes this place is trash. He doesn't want to stay here, so he starts calling out to the physical realm until some random mages hear him. Imagine being so bored of death that you just decide you don't want to be dead anymore. This man Sanu Zal is built different, son. 400 years before Noxus, some mages who heard him grant his wish with the goal of controlling him, but that plan gets crushed almost immediately. The Conqueror returns as the Iron Revenant Mordekaiser and bodies the mages who brought him back. He then builds his own empire dubbed the Immortal Bastion and continues his conquering streak. This begins a time period dubbed the Reign of the Iron Revenant. More tyrannical rule lasted for 300 years. Then finally, in 100 BN, barbarians from the Noxide tribe seem up to jump his ass and seal him away. These Noxide tribes would soon form the nation of Noxus in the future. But before we get into that, we gotta talk about a dude who let the quest for Cheeks ruin his kingdom. 
It's now 25 years before Noxus, a kingdom far off in the east of the kingdom of Camivore is being led by a lover boy named Viego. However, people are getting sick of the king's shit. His love for his wife Isolde is making him half-ass his kingly duties, so his allies plan a coup against him and attempt to assassinate him. But the assassination fails. Instead, they poison his wife! Viego's general and niece, Callista, is then sent to the Blessed Isle to look for a cure. When she gets there, the people of the Isles promise to cure the wife. They just have to bring her here and keep all this to themselves. While Callista's out on her quest, Camivor goes into chaos as Viego falls into a deep depression over his wife's state. He put his lieutenant Hecarim in charge, but that dude threw the place into even more chaos. My man started killing citizens to get them to stop wilding about the king. Who the fuck does that? Eventually, Callista returns, but she's too late. Viego's wife died. In a twisted fury, he locks her up. Then he invades the Blessed Isles to try and use their water to resurrect his wife. But as you probably guessed, the ritual goes completely wrong, and Isolde comes back as a wraith. She hits him with the Una Reverse and stabs him with his own sword. The irony is crazy. This sparks a magical explosion that shatters the barrier between the physical and the spiritual realm. They call this event the Ruination. Several dead souls storm the area and shrouded in black mist, thus morphing the Blessed Isles into the Shadow Isles. This leaves the place inhospitable. The only beings left here are the race of Viego, Callista, Hecarim, and everyone else involved in the Ruination. Wild how all this was caused by someone who loved so much that he couldn't do his fucking job. Hate to see it. Yup, but sadly the elves don't stop there. See, before all that ruination shit happened, the Blessed Isles was home to renowned researchers who protected magical artifacts, specifically the world runes. In case you forgot, the world runes are what created Runeterra. With the Blessed Isles gone, the public becomes aware of the world runes. Then in 13 BN, a huge war breaks out to control their power. A mage by the name of Ryze and his master Tyrus make it their mission to collect the world runes to stop this war. But that soon becomes a solo mission when Ryze is forced to kill his master to stop him from using the runes for his own gain. Though the war only lasted a fraction of the time the last few wars did, the damage done was beyond comprehension. Many died, and several refugees were left to fend for themselves. A bunch of Noxai tribes hid in Moore's former immortal bastion for protection. Others decide to move to the west where they discovered a land filled with petrocyte, stones that can weaken magic. The war goes on for a decade, then after some time, the refugees come out of hiding to make the best of what's left of this war-torn land. Thus finally taking us to year zero, when Noxus is born. The Noxai tribes that held themselves in the Immortal Bastion unite and build the capital of Noxus on top of the Bastion. As they grow in power, the folks who move to the west with all the anti-magic stuff form the nation of Demacia. Since the Rune War fucked everything up, the people of Demacia utilized the Petrocyte to make the place a haven from magic. Back to Noxus, by the year 349 they basically become the Fire Nation. They've amassed enough strength to build their empire, so now they want to spread the good word of Noxus by expanding their territory. This gets others to fear them, but I'm gonna be real with you, Noxus ain't all that bad. I mean, sure, from the outside, they look like an evil militaristic powerhouse that forces their young to fight to the death. But on the inside, the nation is actually hella diverse and fair. Anyone has a chance to be somebody in Noxus. Your worth isn't based on your class or anything shallow like that. It's based on who you are, and I fuck with that. They also still allow magic here, unlike in Demacia where you'd get arrested just for thinking about it. Yeah, so Nox is actually pretty cool. I mean, I'm not here for forcefully taking over all of Runeterra, but you know, Empire's gonna Empire. While this is going on, the port city of Zahn, formerly known as Ashra of Zahn, is looking to make their own come up. They made this plan to open trade route by blowing up part of the isthmus that connects the northern and southern continent of Runeterra. But the plan backfires when their Chemtech bombs seemingly go off by accident. This not only destroys the isthmus, but six large portions of Zahn as well. Luckily for the people of Zahn, the champion Windspear Janna comes into air bend away the poisonous gas, saving many lives in the process. From this day onward, the people of Zahn praise Janna as their savior. By 772, Zahn is rebuilt. Structures called Sungates are created to regulate trading and this ends up making Zahn a bunch of money. But instead of using that money to fix this broken city, the rich use it to build a city on top of it, naming it Piltover. So all of Zahn basically got shafted by their own people. It be your own nigga, son. Word. Thanks to this, Piltover becomes a city of progress, while Zahn devolves into a forgotten cesspool of crime and gas. On the east side of the map, immigrants from the Masia, Freljord, and Ionia move to a place known as the Serpent Isles. Eventually, they turn the place into the port city of Bilgewater. Champs like Gangplank, Misfortune, and Twisted Fate live here. The Yodel Fizz also pops in here after being in a catatonic state since like the beginning of time. Nigga, what? Yup, this fish fucker left the timeline and came back just like how he eased out the games. Crazy. But with that, it's time to talk about another war, because y'all know these mortals can't help but succumb to the smoke. We move to 787. At this point, Nox has already conquered a fair amount of territory, but their conquest comes to a halt when Demacia steps in. This sparks the first Demacian-Noxian War. The first major attack was led by the Noxian general Sion. He charged against Demacian forces even though he was severely outnumbered. His warriors ultimately get bodied by our boy Sion and about that pussy shit. My man pulls a Zabuza and tanks everything the Demacians throw at him. 
Then before he dies, he strangles the King Jarvan I with his bare hands. Dude is a whole menace. After that battle, the Masia continues to push Noxus back. The Grand General of Noxus wasn't a fan of all the L's they were taking, so he tasked a secret group of mages dubbed the Black Rose to revive their fallen champion, Sion. Unfortunately, the revival ritual brought Sion back as a blood crazed maniac. After sacrificing a bunch of their own to calm him down, they successfully seal him away. So now Noxus is down pretty bad. The Masia fought them off, and one of their best warriors is now a ticking time bomb. But instead of laying low and recuperating for a while, like they should, the Grand General declares the need to flex on Runeterra just to show their strength. He commands his forces to invade Ionia, and this sparks a whole new war, the Noxian Ionian War. Now a lot of shit happens during this chunk of time, fam. A shit ton of champions like Yasuo, Riven, and Aurelia come in and start throwing hands. Ash and Sejuani have their own arc. The boy Dunkmaster Darius and his brother Draven join the Noxian army. It's a lot of shit. Like, this war could have its own video. So for the sake of time, I'm just gonna give you a synopsis of what happened. However, if you wanna know more, I highly recommend watching Necrit right here on YouTube. The dude is a league genius. He makes a bunch of videos on the lore, and honestly, without him, don't know if I would've been able to make sense of the timeline. So check him out, and let him know your boy Dochi sent you. Anyway, the Noxian Ionian War goes south for Noxus. They claim some territories, yeah, but Ionia beats the shit out of them for it. Eventually, the Noxian named Swain plots a coup against a dumbass Grand General who started all this bullshit. Once they take him out, Swain orders the Noxian army to retreat from Ionia. He then establishes the Triferix, a council of three who are responsible for running Noxus. This way, if someone loses their shit, you got two other rulers who can put them in check. Swain decides that this new council should represent the three pillars of Noxus. He represents Vision, he chooses Darius to represent Might, and selects an unknown figure dubbed the Faceless to represent Guile. With that, Noxus continues to grow with more balance than it did last time, but that's about all for the major events of the timeline. After 989, a lot of the key players in the universe break away and do their own things. There's a second invasion of Ionia done by Noxus, but they fail, again. A bunch of characters from before like some of the Darken and Morden up coming back. But I'd say the most important event though, was the freeing of Pantheon. See, before Pantheon became Pantheon, he was a warrior from the Record tribe named Atreus. By the way, if I am butchering any of these names, I am so sorry, I am trying my best. After him and his friend Pylos got ambushed by barbarians, they tried climbing Mount Targon for power, but the journey was too much for his friends, so he died in his arms. With the only one left on the mountain being Atreus, the Aspect of War decided to enter his body and seize control of his mind. From then on, the Aspect used his dude's body to fight off any remaining Darken in Runeterra. Its crusade brought it to the Darken Aatrox, and this dude beat the shit out of the Aspect. Dude slapped the constellation out of existence, fam. Free from the shackles of the Aspect, Atreus returned home to heal from the wound Aatrox left him. In his time spent healing, he realizes that there is power in mortality. Just because you're mortal doesn't mean you have to run away from the power of the gods. I mean, I would, but Atreus is built different, so yeah. This new understanding fuels him when he meets Aatrox again in battle. At first, Aatrox easily gains the upper hand, but Atreus' willpower reignites the aspect of war. He ascends in his own way, naming himself Pantheon, then defeats Aatrox for his people. He then vows to be the shield that protects all mortals from destruction. Now this is a great story and all, but Aatrox killing that aspect put all of Runeterra in danger. Y'all remember my boy Sol? He was being forced to listen to the aspect of war this whole time. But when Aatrox killed his ass, Aurelian Sol was set free. So now Sol is on his way to enact his revenge on Runeterra, even though the aspects are more to blame for all this. But that is it for the League timeline. Will Aurelian Sol destroy Runeterra? Will the Watchers beat him to the punch and just wipe out the whole universe? Find out whenever Riot decides to continue the timeline, which can happen at any time. There are so many stories we didn't get into that could easily be elaborated on. And there are so many things that weren't fully explained, like who the Giants from the Sky were, and exactly where the humans from the Westward Migration came from. So yeah, they could continue it, or they could continue feeding us lore about the many mysteries of Runeterra. Either way, I am here for the new stories because this League lore is actually hella interesting. Honestly, wouldn't mind diving deeper into this world and making videos about specific characters and events. Let me know in the comments. But with that, let's switch gears, leave the lore section, and finish this video with a discussion about what's next for League of Legends. So over the course of this video, we've learned a lot about how much of a monster league is in the industry. However, about two years ago, Riot announced some things that will change his intellectual property forever. During their 10th anniversary celebration in 2019, they announced several new games that would expand upon the league universe. This is a big deal because up until then, Riot called themselves Riot Games, but they only really had one game. League of Legends. This event added several games to the Riot library. T1, 
team fight tactics, an auto battler game with lead characters brought to mobile, League of Legends Wild Rift, a version of League that was rebuilt from the ground up for mobile was announced and officially released in 2020, a card game featuring characters from League that Legends of Ruterra was announced and released in 2020 as well. A turn-based RPG titled Ruin King A League of Legends Story was announced and released in 2021 for consoles. And a third-person adventure game following the Champ Nunu was announced and is planned to release later this year. The games that I'm most excited for though are the fighting game and the MMO that got revealed. We don't have a lot of info on the MMO, but the fighting game, currently dubbed Project L, is looking like straight heat, son. They've only shown so much gameplay, but I already know I need it in my life. Look at my boy Echo flexing on the scene, son. I want to do that. And at the head of the dev team for this game are Tom and Tony Cannon. If you don't know who these godsends are, they're the guys who started EVO, the biggest fighting game event of the year. So I feel like with the Cannon twins here, Project L is going to be a major W. I really wish we'd get more info on that MMO though because the amount of possible lore that can be in that shit, bruh. And honestly, the world of Terror is dope, so I wouldn't mind traveling around the place as my own character. But outside of the games, the biggest announcement that came from this 10 year anniversary celebration was that of Arcane, the first League of Legends anime. It released in 2021 on Netflix and fam, I'm gonna be real with you. I didn't believe Riot could do it. They were dropping some dope ass cinematics at the time, but I was like, Riot making a whole anime? Nah, I don't buy it. But people, when I tell you that Arcane blew every single expectation I had out the water, bro. Listen, here's a synopsis. The show covers the story of Vi, Jinx, and a bunch of other elite characters in Piltover and Zon. That's all I'm gonna tell you. Because if you have not watched this shit, you need to cook off this video and treat yourself to some greatness, fam. Me summarizing the events would not do it justice. So instead of spoiling, allow me to just praise this masterpiece real quick. Arcane was the littest thing on Netflix last year, and you didn't even need to play League to enjoy it. Watching Arcane was like having a League Celestial walk up to me, grab my hand, and fling me into the world of League. You didn't have to know the world because they organically gave you details about it, but left enough out to keep you curious about what the hell was really going on. You didn't have to know the characters from the game because the show made them dope and even more human. Hell, the superb character writing made me want to try out some new champs. The animations were some of the best I've seen, which is crazy when everyone seems to be going off with animations these days. It was like they grabbed the characters from the game, put them in 4K, and slapped them in an anime. And honestly, as a League player, I got emotional watching this show, son. Not even gonna front, I cried right when Heimerdinger showed up, bro. It was at that moment where I was like, they really brought this video game world to life and they did it better than I could have ever imagined. Bro, shout out to whoever choreographed all those fights, fam. As a Vi main, I appreciate that the team really made her look and move like a fighter. She had her guard up, she was snapping her fist back with the punches and shit, she was bobbing and weaving like a champ, bro. I remember reading an article talking about how Arcane beat the video game adaptation curse and just thinking to myself, oh shit, I completely forgot this is based off a game. It was that good, y'all. Really had me thinking I was watching some standalone show. But I digress, Arcane was lit as hell, fam. Don't knock it till you try it, because if you're watching this and the world of League has intrigued you at least a little bit, you would love Arcane. And this part doesn't really matter because critic scores are just scores, but Rotten Tomato gave it 100%. I'm just saying. But yeah, if you're on the fence about it, this is your boy Doji telling you that Arcane is worth your time. Season 2 has already been confirmed, but it's not coming out for a while, and that's okay. Take all the time y'all need for this greatness. Anyway, outside the new games and the banger ass anime, did y'all know Riot is even flexing with their music? They have three music groups based off of skins in the game, Pentakill, KDA, and True Damage. And these guys be dropping heat, bro. So not only do the skins have lore, but these niggas can transcend the game and make music? Yes, bro. Echo be saving time in one universe and dropping bars in another. Shit's crazy. So I am positive League is gonna be dropping more heat and I am here for it. But to my knowledge, that's all right is dropping for League in the coming years. And I gotta say, the future of League is looking bright as fuck. Yeah, these guys have been dropping banger after banger. So far, everything that released from that 10th anniversary announcement was dope as shit. It's like they learned everything they needed by focusing on making League as great as it could be. Then they went off in 2019. And I am so proud of how far this little IP came. It really started from the bottom. Now it's becoming bigger than its own game. I had major issues with how Riot was treating their staff, but thankfully from what I hear, they seem to be doing better for them. Years from now, I can see the future generation talking about League like we talk about Pokemon. More and more people are gonna join this co I mean fan base, whether it be through League, Tiff, or anything else under the IP. But with all that being said, let us know what you think about League after watching this video. If you play, who's your main? And drop your username, maybe we can run some matches. I promise I won't feed. Nah, he gonna feed. Conscience, shut up. Get out of bronze and maybe I will. Yo, what up fam, and thank you guys so much for watching a new episode of Honest Gaming History. Not gonna lie to you, I am so proud of myself for getting this video done. 
did not think I could cover even a fraction of the lore that there was for League of Legends, but somehow I managed to do it. And it was actually pretty fun. The world is pretty crazy, but I'm gonna be real with you. I only touched the surface. I've only tapped into the, the little bit of power that we see on the outside of the ocean of League of Legends because there is a lot of lore here and I've barely covered anything. I feel like even though I made this long ass video, I literally just started my League of Legends lore journey. So if you want me to make more videos about League of Legends lore, let me know in the comments. Anyway, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like as well as letting me know if you want to see me cover more League of Legends lore. Let me know who else you want to see me cover in future episodes of Honest Gaming History. Share this with all your friends who want to know more about League. Subscribe if you want to see more of me and hit that bell if you want to stay notified whenever I upload new content. And if you're one of the people who want to see me make more League content, I recommend hitting that bell just in case. Shout out to my amazing patrons, the guys who give the extra funds each month to help your boy out. And shout out to my a rank patrons, the guys who give even more each month. Broken Rosary, Third Dynasty, Daniel Gonzalez, Victor Garcia, Mustard Gas, Graham Lansborough, Zach Haji, Curtis Clarkson, G Haven Esports Team, Jody Boy, Nick the Nocturne, Jakari Scott, Beer Revel, Sugi, and Skrazor. Appreciate you guys so much for what you do. Thanks to you guys being able to create all this content each month, so thank you. However, as you guys know, if you cannot support financially, you just getting this far already means a lot, so thank you. But with that being said, I'm off to start working on the next Honest Gaming History. So, be easy. Stay lit, stay healthy out there, Black Lives Matter, and don't forget, you can do whatever the hell you put your mind to. All it takes is practice and time. And happy belated birthday once again, babe. Don't forget to check out her Twitch channel. It's like in my description down below. Check it out, it's right there. She makes great content. Anyways, I'm off this. Peace out, fam, have a good one.